Greetings, Cleveland. This is Janice's Gems, and I'm Janice Manning, part of St. Martin de Poor's Corporate Work Study Program, interning at TV20. We are Cleveland. Today, my guest is Mr. Clarence Gilmore. How are you doing, Clarence? Real good. How are you, Janice? I'm good. So, how did you get into film and theater? I got into film and theater as a form of escapism. When I was in my 20s, uh, uh, I got approached by a, a church group who wanted to uh, cast me as, in a role a, as a villain. And they asked me, was I interested? I said, yes, because I'd always been interested. Because in my day coming up, it was very few people who looked like us on TV. And I always used to imagine, like, wow, maybe that could be me because we don't see us on TV. And when I say in my day, I'm a 70s baby. So in the 70s and early 80s, very rare, but as time progressed, you see us more and more on TV, but maybe not as much in mainstream. So I say in the form of escapism and just opportunity. Did you like playing a villain role? Like, did you feel like that was your role? Sort of, kind of, not really though, because I had to be, well, it, it made me act because I'm not that guy. So yes, in the form of making me act, knowing the form of the script that was wrote, I was this really bad drug dealer guy. It wasn't nice. So it kind of, uh, you know. So before you got asked to participate as a villain in mm -hmm. the film, like what inspired you to like actually say yes? Did you just do it because you like to escape and try something new or you did it because you like thought like it would be a fun thing to do? Both. It was both of those. It was it was full escapism. And I was like, you know, this would be pretty fun. This would be something to do because by rights, I always wanted to be a comedian anyway. I thought when I got out of high school, I was going to New York and go to Greenwich Village and do this whole comedian thing. My mother's like, uh, no, you're going to school. So okay. cancel that. <laughs> so along the way, when you first started till now, who helped you along the way? First and foremost, I have to give uh, uh, a, a good shout out to um Presta Pickett, that he's a uh, he's in the he has a master of fine arts degree and he's the uh, director over at Cleveland State University in their Black Studies program. He uh, got me in, showed me the roles of acting, and he actually let me come to his classes when he was teaching at Case and Cleveland State to learn stage management, acting skills, uh, theater skills, and things of that nature. And then I took a few classes at Tri C, and it was all because of him. Then after that, I went on a long hiatus and I met Mr. Cornell Hoover Calhoun III and the rest is history. So those two gentlemen I credit with uh, getting me uh, into the business per se and fulfilling some of the dreams I want to do offshoot. So why, so for them two people, Mr. Calhoun and Mr. Pickett, you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, why did you like first think of them? Like what do they do to make you Think of them. They're awesome playwrights. They have they have an imagination that's beyond what most let's just black men think. I mean, you can go to Hollywood, New York, uh, Chicago, and now Atlanta, different places, but you rarely see us as playwrights and 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 film directors and things of that nature. I like their stories they told. They embraced me. They 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 trusted me. They believed in me, and they were like, "Hey, we want you to work." for us. So when I first, with Mr. Cal with Mr. Uh, Presser Pickett, I was just an actor and he picked me out and said, hey, would you like to do stage? I need somebody I can trust to help me put things together. I'm gonna teach you some directing. So he taught me how to direct. He taught me how to do stage and theater setup, stage and theater design. Um, anything that had to do with theater and the stage, as far as Case Western Reserve and Cleveland State was, was involved, I was that guy. And I didn't, and the good thing is I didn't have to pay for any of it. Then after that, I got introduced to Mr. Cornell Hooper Calhoun III on the film we were doing called Standalone. He was real standoffish. And then he said, hey, you know, uh, me and some other his other colleagues, they were doing some short films. And um, I told him I was interested. So we started doing it. And he looked at what I was about and said, man, I'm going to keep you if you're willing to stay. I was like, absolutely, because this is what I want to do. So we've done several short films since 20. I want to say 19, no, 2018, 19, and up until now. So when you first started till now, like what, what do you think the big difference is technology wise or just people wise? What do you think is the, what has changed the most? I would definitely say technology, okay. way technology. Cause when I started, we just had, we had these really big bulky, awkward cameras. Now you can shoot with a cell phone or the cameras we have now are super small. 
Uh, the boom mics and things we use were really huge and heavy. Now they're reasonably light, uh, big time technology. And I would say some some with the people, but you still get to where right now, if you were to say, hey, Clarence, um, I want to do a show, so on and so forth. We would have a thousand people lined up for auditions to act, but you would make, have four or five that's lined up to want to do the work. And my part is I like the work, the behind the scene situation. Um, the, the sound, the putting everything together, using your imagination to make it happen. So you would come to me and say, Clarence, this is what I want to see. How do we make it happen? I said, don't worry about it. I'll get back to you. I'll get back to you with my thoughts and ideas, thinking outside the box. It, it, it employs you to dig into your imagination and your resources to see what can you do to make your vision happen. And I get a thrill out of it. It's like an energy. For, it's like a, it's a high or energetic uh, feeling that I get when Mr. Cornell calls me and says, hey, we need to do this. Figure it out. And it works. So mostly technology, but some people. So behind the scenes as a production manager, mm -hmm. what are your main responsibilities? Like when you're on set, what are your to do's and to not do's? Well, the, the, the to do's is almost everything. You got to make sure all the costumes, scripts, props, scenery, set, uh, all the players in the game, the camera folks, the, the sound people, everything that encompasses, you have to know the who, what, when, where, and why, all of that. You have to also cater to everyone's need. Like, what do you need? How can I make you comfortable in order to project and act and do what you got to do? And first and foremost, you got to make sure the director is happy with everything you put together. The don't say is, don't tell that director what you can't do. Okay. <laughs> don't do that. You better tell them. I'm going to get back to you if you know that something's going awry. Like we were on at one set. Some things kind of went sideways, but we made it work. I didn't tell him to after. He said, well, I didn't even know. I said, good. So the don'ts is never say what you can't do and what's not happening. Improvise. Now, if emergency comes up, that's another story. But you, you have to see what your point of view as far as emergencies are. But if it's something you can handle, don't say nothing because you want the director at ease. You want the actors at ease. So. I would just say never say what you can't do and what's not going to happen. But the to do's is everything. So and how do you make sure that everything is done correctly? I have a checklist okay. and I write everything down and then I try to make sure I remember everything and I make sure I get there early enough to make sure we have enough time so I can go through that checklist so that as I go down, I have a time frame. This should happen at this time. Who's here? Who's not here? And as that checklist gets checked off, I'm I'm calm. If it's not, I'm a little a little agitated, a little anxiety written. But okay, so you mentioned like if an emergency happened, how do you overcome that? Like if some somebody say, oh, I can't show up today, something happened. How do you make sure that everything still runs smoothly after that point? I would go to the director and let him know that that person or thing or whatever it is we needed isn't going to happen that day. So then we're going to have to shoot around it. That's the magic of film. We could shoot almost everything but that part until we get that person or thing we need to do it. Now, if it was theater, whole another ball game. You got to have a, a stand in or understudy, as they're called, that make sure that that understudy knows everything that that major actor was supposed to do. Make sure that they know it. Uh, Mr. Calhoun told me a story one time where he had to use this young lady because uh, one of the actresses was in a uh, she got stopped by the police and one thing led to another. So she got arrested. But he said he luckily had this young lady. She went out there with the script on stage, but it was fine. But she still nailed it. So just thinking outside the box and, and knowing your resources and people that can stand in, even if they really weren't one. So it, it takes a lot. You got to get to know everybody and, and the whole aspect of what you're doing. OK, so I know that on set you work with the audio like what? Do you have to do when you do audio? Like, what is the main points that you need to make sure that the audio is good when you're working with the audio? That you have that mic position in a direct, because it's, it's a directional mic, so it has to be directly at that person that's speaking. If it's not, it's not going to pick up really well. Um, they're called omnidirectional, but we just call them directional shotgun mics. Um, making sure that the person elevates, but not screaming. And then you have to adjust your volume on your whatever adjunct or piece of equipment you're using to capture the sound. So direct mic positioning, making sure your volume is good. So then that people like that work here at TV 20, like Chris or Ralston, they can edit it and it's not too loud, not too soft. But they have they have some, as we call it, editing magic that they can do to balance it out. Yeah. But mainly, oh, 
keeping that boom mic out of the set, <laughs> out of the camera scene too. So keeping the boom mic up, keeping it out of the set and making sure you adjust your volume and making sure that you're directly on that person that's speaking. And it, it gets hard when it's two people sometimes. So it takes a lot of stamina and thought process to, to, to make sure. And then you have a set of headphones on, at least you should, so that you're picking up and making sure you hear what's going on. So when you, when you first started, were you working audio or no? When I first started in the business, no, I was just an actor. That was it. And then so, I started doing production management. I kind of got thrusted into audio just helping out. Okay, so now that you work with audio, what is your favorite piece of technology or equipment that helps you make sure everything is perfect? It's this machine called a, a, a Zoom recorder. <laughs> it, it, it does everything. It, it can show you sound bites. You can file every uh, word that's said in a file so you can go back to it. It makes it easier for the editor to find what they're looking for when they got to uh, edit and splice the video with the, with the sound card. So it, it, it's very good piece of equipment. So when you're working on set and you have a team of people, how do you make sure that the team is working together and everybody is having a good time? We have a come to Jesus meeting before <laughs> before this all starts. Or as I said, come to Clarence meeting. I make sure I talk to everyone. I give the utmost respect, but I also command respect and let them know time is money, money is time. This is what I need you to do if you can't let me know. It's all about communication. You have to have a very open form of communication and dialogue with everybody and make sure that they understand fully what it is you want them to do. And if they don't, you fix that by means of what don't you get? What can I help you with? Or you may have to replace them. But luckily, we had a pretty good team of people that we've never had to do that with. OK, so what do you think some of your most successful projects was as working as a um, you were well, as of today, production manager under Calhoun right. Blue Productions, everything we've done, we it's perfect. <laughs> everything we've done. Um, one, I would definitely say the most, uh, the one that inspires me the most is uh, we. Mr. Calhoun wrote a script called Longwood, mm -hmm. and I have this nickname called Clay Goody. So he used them in the play, uh, well, in the script that we was gonna be a, a, a TV series. Hopefully, we we've won over a hundred plus awards. That's good. In different festivals so I would say to date that one now he wrote it but he actually gave me input when he said here read this what you think about this what you think about that so it made me feel good that I mean he's an awesome playwright that he relied on me to see what I thought and he took some pointers like well we can't do this what about that and he changed a few things not just on my merit just because we had communication and it made sense so I would say hopefully the TV plot movie series Longwood that that will that would be the best Okay, so besides from you being behind the camera, mm -hmm. when you're in front of the camera performing, what is your favorite part? I like comedic roles. Mm -hmm. That's it. If, if I can have a comedic role, I'm cool. I mean, some serious stuff too, but I haven't had those. Well, yes, I did. In, in standalone, it was pretty serious, so it was pretty cool. But I like comedic roles if I can get them. Okay, so when you're performing in front of the camera, how do you make sure that you're putting on your best? Um, you, you have to study your script. You have to learn your craft. You have to study that script day in, day out. That should be all you read, all you do for that time frame. Clear your schedule because once you commit to something, you want to do your best because once it's recorded on tape, that's it. If, if, if you're going to put it out, if you, if it's not something you really want to do and you got some angst about it, anxiety, don't do it. So, okay. so do you have a preference of being behind the camera or in front of the camera acting? behind okay. why behind. do you say behind because i like the, the 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 process from a to z i like the the concept the concept of an idea mm -hmm. we take that idea and we frame it into a story and then what do we have to do to get that concept from a story to a finished conclusion product it takes a lot we talk on the phone a lot we go scout out different um places where we want to shoot um, it's, it's a whole adventure. Like a couple of weeks ago, me and Mr. Calhoun were together. Oh, no, it was last week. I'm sorry. We went to a couple scenes, uh, a couple places where we wanted to shoot some scenes. And to me, that's intriguing and fun because if you think you nailed it, it's good. Or he'll say, nah, that don't work. I don't like it. <laughs> Let's go somewhere else. I mean, he's blatantly honest. So then that starts you on that trek again to, all right, we got to find exactly what he's looking for. So trying to look through the lens of a director and hope, hoping you nailed it. It's pretty cool. So concept, story, conclusion, and all the pieces and parts that go on, whether it be 
the people who are going to act in it. As I said, the scene, i.e. set, um, who you're going to use as your uh, camera person, mm -hmm. who you're going to use as your editor, uh, what music goes behind it. Um, it's a lot of parts to that puzzle, and I like the journey until it's over. Then you start the next one. Sounds like it could be a good experience. So, Absolutely. What are your strengths when it comes to being behind the camera, and what are some of your weaknesses when it comes to being behind the camera? Strength, I would say, um, are being able to put the project together. I'm really good at task management and organizational skills. My organizational skills and making sure tasks are done, I'm like OCD with that. That's cool. The weaknesses are sometimes overemphasizing what I think people can do and trying to push them to that and not being able to. Um, I'm a strong advocate for people, big advocate for children, mm -hmm. trying to get them to develop into who and what they want to be, especially behind the scenes, because it's, you know, when, when you're when you're shooting a film or doing theater, it's imaginary. It's a form of escapism. You have to try to push that person to become that part who they're really not at that moment and trying to encourage them and get them to do that through rehearsals, through talking to them and and trying to make them see that they have a full blown potential to do this. It, it can be kind of challenging, and so and a lot of times it doesn't work, but sometimes it does. So I would say that would be my uh, biggest weakness. Okay, so what advice would you give to someone who's at a young age and want to get into film? I would say go to as many auditions as possible. Uh, take as many roles as possible that don't fit your character to a point, but not to the point to where it makes you feel uncomfortable. Like I would never do a female role. It won't happen. I'm not dressing <laughs> up, but no, no skirt, dress, lip, not gonna happen. Okay. So I would say fulfill your potential, but to the points where you still keep your integrity and respect for yourself. Because Hollywood will have you do some stuff that can truly, for that little short two hour, hour, 30 minute film, you got the rest of your life to live. So you need to think about it. Um, so that would be it. Okay, what is your artistic dream? Artistic dream is to get Longwood produced <laughs> and be assistant director with Mr. Calhoun and make different series or episodes of it and just continue to put out good films and good content. What do you think you should, what do you think like is the best thing to do to make sure that y'all reach that goal? Keep trying, keep putting the film in film festivals, uh, keep writing new adaptations of Longwood, which he does daily and he'll call and say, sometimes he'll call and say, hey, what do you think about it? And then he say, no, nah, never mind, I want to tell you, I'll just put it and write it and give it to you. So uh, just to keep plugging away at Longwood and, until it reaches where it needs to be, because if we stop, we'll never know. So what is next for you? Like, what are, what are you working on next to go to the next step? Um, what we're working on next, hopefully, is a couple other uh, children's film, one called uh, Hero, and um, this other one. It's not a children's film, but it, it's one that he wrote a while ago called Savannah Suites that is actually in a uh, film festival now. So I'm not real sure which one is going to come first, but we're talking about it. But I'm really thinking Savannah Suites and then possibly Hero or one of the other uh, films because we work a lot with the youth. Savannah Suites isn't uh, a youth film, but after if we get that one shot, we'll go back to working with the youth and trying to get some of his films out. But a lot of our young people are getting older, so <laughs> we might have to find some new folks to uh, uh, to fulfill that. So it's hard to say. We'll see. Well, I thank you for coming here and talking with me today and telling me about your experiences. I appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. This is Janice's Gems. And remember, not all gems are made of stone, but of love.